If the question is, is there any example in history of a fully libertarian society? Well, yeah, of course not. But that's not an argument against the theory because mm -hmm. there wasn't any precedent for colonies of Great Britain breaking away from Great Britain either. Right. Um, so you can do stuff that's never been done before. And in any case, philosophically, that's not an argument. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Essential Scholars podcast. I'm your host, Rosemary Fike, and today I'm going to be continuing my conversation with Ian Scoble about the philosopher Robert Nozick. Ian Scoble is a professor of philosophy at Bridgewater State University in Massachusetts, and he's also a senior fellow with the Fraser Institute. He's the author of the Essential Robert Nozick book, and I'm so happy to have you back to continue our chat. Happy to be here. So in our last conversation, we left off talking a little bit about Robert Nozick's view of that framework for utopia. And I had said, I have a question that I kind of wanted to start this chat with, which is, you know, how do we make sure that people do not meddle in the utopias of others? So before we get into that answer, maybe just recap a little bit about what that framework for utopia is for people who might forget everything that we talked about last last episode. Sure. Nozick's vision of the minimal state is not a single social order, but a framework for a variety of social orders in which everyone's rights are protected and human diversity and pluralism are given their fullest fruition. Um, so he imagines lots of different sorts of communities arising. And the only thing that the framework ensures is that people are free to choose whichever community they want to be a part of, whichever form of living they want to be participating in, and also their right of exit should it become unpleasant for them. Um, so, you know, people like to caricature Nozick as saying things, oh, well, you know, he thinks you have a right to sell yourself into slavery. And that's literally not true, um, because if the society that you're in is abusive in that way, the framework protects your right to exit that society. Mm -hmm. So your question was about um, societies meddling with other societies. Yeah. Um, so for example, if we think about like a lot of modern policy conversations, just take maybe like issues about bodily autonomy or something, you know, uh, we have people who believe that things should be up to the individual's choice. We have other people who believe maybe you shouldn't be allowed to make certain choices. Um, so how do we ensure that we might, you know, prevent one community from saying, hey, this neighboring community allows for behaviors that we find morally, you know, reprehensible. And it's our duty to make sure that nobody can make that choice. It's not enough for us just to refrain from it. Nobody should be able to make that choice. Yeah, that's sort of contrary to the vision of the framework, because the whole, point, the whole point is that different people are going to want, some people might want like a, a stricter, more religious order. Other mm -hmm. people might want a much more cosmopolitan, open order. And so the idea is that, um, so whichever one you've chosen to move into, right, you must th therefore think that the other one's not as good because right. obviously you chose that one and not this one. Um, but the whole idea is that everybody's different. And so people are going to form different associative communities as they like. What the framework protects is your right to choose and your right to exit. So if the other community that you don't like is as intolerable as you're making it out to be, presumably people would want to exit. Like people, when I tell people about the Amish communities where they don't have electricity, you know, teenagers are typically aghast to hear this, right? What do you mean there's no electricity? That means you wouldn't be able to have uh, cell phones or stereos or whatever. Like, right. But anybody in that community who finds that intolerable leaves the community, right? Mm -hmm. But that means that all the ones who are still in the community don't find it intolerable. So what, what you'd find out that you're doing is you're substituting a value judgment about your life for a, a judgment about other people's lives, which means you've sort of overlooked the fact that uh, human nature is very pluralistic and everybody's a little bit different. Um, now, we often have enough in common that we can form communities, mm -hmm. um, which is great. Um, but 
it would be a bit to ex to expect that they would all be the same kind of community precisely because we're all so different. So as long as the framework protects both your right of choice and your right of exit, then there really shouldn't be any complaint about how intolerable I think that other community would be because it's obviously okay for the people that live there. Now, we don't wanna make this into a total um, moral relativism sort of thing. I remember a lot of people used to say, you know, that um, you can't criticize any culture no matter how awful because those are their traditions or whatever. That's not exactly what Nozick's doing here because a lot of those cultures that we would criticize, you know, like this, you know, the slave owning societies or whatever, um, there's no right of exit. So it's not analogous to what he's describing here. Um, so it, it, it's not a simple or simplistic matter of saying, well, whatever those communities do, I guess that's right for them because that's not true if there's no right of exit. But in his framework, that's what the overall minimal state is protecting, not only a right of choice, but a right of exit. That means we can infer that the people who remain in that community are getting something of value out of being a part of that community. So what might we say to somebody who raises the issue that exit can be costly? So so how does how might we we deal with that because if you think about I don't know the the US we have somewhat of a, a federalist federal federalism system where different states have the ability to make rules that apply just in that state. Um, and if you don't like them, you could move, but it's not always cheap or affordable to move from one state to the next. So how does Nozick deal with that in any way? Not that I'm aware of, so I don't want to speculate about what he might say, but I'm happy to take a stab at it myself I would from a Nozickian point of say. view. I, I mean, you can imagine if, if you're this, you've decided that this community that you're in is something that you're not happy with and so you want to leave. And of course, that happens to people all the time. But as you point out, often cost, there's too much cost associated with exit and you wouldn't be able to do it. Um, one possible answer to that would be if, if what you can contribute to a society is valuable, I can imagine a society being willing to help you move there. Um, for example, some jobs will pay your moving expenses as part of the recruitment process. Because if you say, yeah, we'll hire you, but you have to get yourself here, you might say, well, I'm not going to take the job then because it will cost me $10,000. So many companies will pay your moving expenses because they want you to come work for them instead. right? So you can imagine a whole society having some system worked out like that where people were able to uh, be recruited, so to speak, from other communities. Um, if you're imagining, say, like, you know, like the, the, you know, the in community A, the very poorest person, right? Um, and maybe this person doesn't have the, the sort of um, career skills that the people in community B are so desperate to have that they'll pay for that guy's moving expenses. I guess that's a problem, but. Interesting fact here is that it's not any more of a problem than it is in the real world. So one of the things that's, this is what's dangerous by using the word utopia, is we have a tendency to think that that must mean everything's perfect. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have to mean everything's perfect. It just has to mean that there's no way you could do it any better, right? And so if there's a particular problem in Nozick's ideal world, but it's the same sort of problem we already have anyway, then it's not clear that that's an objection to his view, right? So is there going to be somebody in his world who isn't able to afford to move from point A to point B? Maybe that's true, and that would be awful, but it's already true now, and it's still awful, but then that's not a reason to reject what he's saying. As long as what he's saying would be better than the world we live in now, then it's a good idea. Right. Do you see what I'm saying? And I'm not trying yeah. to weasel out of it. Yeah, but no, no, no. There no, may be some mean. objections that you could come up with. Because well, you have to say, as compared to what? Exactly. Right? What is the relevant comparison? Exactly. There is no world where this cost doesn't matter. Exactly. It's the same thing with any, like with violent crimes. Well, how would a Nozickian world make sure that there were no murders? Well, 
you couldn't, I guess, but you know, there's murders no matter what social system you're going to come up with. So that can't be your metric for evaluating different social systems. Which mm -hmm. one of them has no murders, right? You, you know, there's going to be people who are predatory. The trick is to find the ways to minimize predatory behavior. One interesting thing that the Nozickian framework does allow for is some comparison across in different sets of institutions that exist in these communities. Yes. We would have more experimentation over the rules and we'd have a bit of an easier time kind of comparing outcomes across these different smaller communities so that we can maybe conclude you know, certain rules lead to outcomes that we like. Maybe we should change our rules in our community. Um, That's a great point. That's a great point. That's one of the things I always uh, point out to my students when we're talking about, you know, issues of federalism. Like I, that's, we don't have the same preferences and we also don't know what rules are going to work right, yep. right away. Yep. That's um, exactly right. Great point. One of the things, I want to change gears a little bit. Um, one of the things that Nozick emphasizes when he's talking about rights and, and property and the fairness is he doesn't focus on the fairness of the outcome of the distribution. He focuses on the fairness of the process. Was this property acquired through a just kind of process? Um, and so if that process is fair, then that uh, distribution is going to be fair. What might Nozick say to people who would raise the criticism that there are people who don't get to play by the same set of rules, that maybe uh, when it comes to certain social justice issues, um, you know, maybe women had different rules and that has contributed to some, some set of inequality that we see today. Um, how do we address that? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's, that's a serious challenge, again, for any uh, theory about the, the, the society. But um, as, as you say, right, he says, if you've, if you've got just holdings and transfer them in just processes, then the outcome it must, by definition, also be just. So the problem is, <clears throat> well, if it's the middle step, so like I stole it, then that, then of course the outcome's not just. But the more tricky thing is, what if the starting condition wasn't just itself, right? So, if I, um, if I uh, uh, say rob your car, so now I'm driving around in this stolen car, and I can sell the car in a perfectly consensual way. So then the other guy says, "Well, hey, I got this great car, so I'm happy because I bought this car," and the other guy's happy because he has all this money. But the problem, of course, is that I didn't own the car in the first place to sell it. I stole it from you. Um, and so what you would have to say is, look, that wasn't your car to sell, which means it's not this other guy's car to own. The car has to be returned to me. Uh, right? And so we all understand that example, right? So mm -hmm. it's like you, you, I don't have the freedom to sell stolen property. Where that gets interesting, of course, is when you think about the history of the world, where people are constantly conquering other people's lands, right? I mean, most obviously uh, in North America, right? It's you know European settlers uh, kicking out the natives and taking their lands and whatnot. But it's not just limited to the Americas. It's also true in Europe and in Asia and so forth. So it's basically the entire history of the world is people conquering other people through aggression and stealing their stuff. So Nozick kind of, um, he, he's, he's not 100% sure what to do with this. He recognizes that this is a problem, but specifically declines to fully tease out all of its ramifications. Um, so again, I don't want to overly speculate here yeah. about what he might say, but he is aware that that's an issue. But the problem is, um, the further extended through time we get, the weirder it's going to be to try to figure out what to do. So the right. example I led with, where I stole your car, then of course you should be able to easily document, yeah, that was my car, this guy stole the car, I'm entitled to get the car back. And that's completely unambiguous, nobody has a problem with that. But if I stole your great-grandmother's car, it might be harder for you to prove now that I'm in possession of what should be your family's property. Um, maybe you could, maybe you couldn't. 
what if it was not my me taking your great grandfather's car, but maybe it was my ancestors ten generations ago took your family's farm ten generations ago. Uh, so how would we? How would you be able to assert your claim there? Maybe you could. Maybe you couldn't. But it gets even more complicated. What if ten generations ago, when my family stole that land from your family. But what if eight generations before that, your family was the one who had stolen it from somebody else? So who's entitled to the land? At some point, it's too hard to figure out how to answer those sorts of questions. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want to seem like there's just nothing we can say about historical injustice issues. So for example, um, many people have pointed out that um, the, the persistent pockets of uh, poverty in African American communities can be directly traced to mortgage lending practices and legalized discrimination practices from just a generation or two ago. So again, it's so there. It seems like you might be able to identify some sort of rectifiable error. Mm -hmm. um, I guess another example is um, when President Roosevelt uh, put Japanese Americans into concentration camps at the beginning of World War II. Mm -hmm. Those people could say, hey, I was unjustly imprisoned and you know, try to get justice for their unjust imprisonment, that sort of thing. Um, but it's, again, the further extended through time, the more complicated to the point of impossibility, it might be to know what to do. So again, my example where my family did dispossess your family, but your family had in turn dispossessed some other family. So I don't know who's entitled to the property now. Right. Um, and, so, you know, and at some point, there's a sort of um, innocence, right? So, you know, I let's say you're um, from uh, Pakistan and you emigrate to Manhattan and you get an apartment in Manhattan and you're working for somebody and you're just making an honest living and you've found a better life for yourself in Manhattan than you had in Pakistan. Um, now it's true, I suppose, that uh, somebody who settled Manhattan had swindled some native out of something, which makes this all sort of weirdly tainted. Not clear that it's this particular immigrant's moral responsibility though. The city's mm -hmm. there, the city's been there for centuries, and this guy is moving there because there's open apartments and jobs to be had. It's not clear what this guy has done wrong to anybody. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it, again, Nozick is aware of the problem um, and says a little bit about it, but also declines to fully explore all of the issues that are complicated by the extensive amounts of time that might make this just sort of overwhelmingly complicated, but he's not unaware of it. Uh, so in that answer, you touched on a lot of things that I kind of wanted to bring up, such as, you know, is there any kind of redistribution that might be justified under an Ozikian sense if the redistribution is to account for past injustices? He seems to suggest, yes. Um, he's got this concept of rectification in one of the chapters. Um, so I, I think he is not completely unamenable uh, to something like that. It, it would it would have to require identifiable um, uh, victims. Mm -hmm. um, less clear how you identify the the wrongdoer. But the dominant protective agency, having assumed unto itself all of the powers of of rights protection, may have some responsibility to do this. Not exactly clear how he thinks that's going to play out. But again, mm -hmm. it's something that he does uh, acknowledge that there's at least a possibility that we would have to do something like that. So I have a question that you didn't touch on the book in the book, but when I in the past have read Anarchy, State, and Utopia, I've always wondered, and you might know why I've wondered this, was Nozick a vegetarian? Oh, actually, I don't know the answer to that. Um, oh, because he, there, at least in the version of Anarchy, State, and Utopia that I've read, he, when he's talking about, you know, how do we define who, you know, gets rights, like maybe we can base it on some sort of, like, level of self-direction, he, I, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, he brings up the idea of, you know, how do we draw the line for different animals? 
right? And would we accept if an alien species came to Earth and said, well, we're much more intelligent than you, so maybe you don't have rights and, and we could eat you. And I would not be okay with that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think what he's doing there is to show that um, while utilitarianism might give us some helpful guidance in thinking about the treatment of animals. Mm -hmm. His point is that that's, but we can't use utilitarianism as a helpful guide to how to treat each other. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I know the passage you're referring to. And, <laughs> and I, I think his point is that utilitarianism might be helpful when we're thinking about say, you know, I want to swat a mosquito or something. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, because the, the, snuffing out the mosquito's life is insignificant relative to my discomfort having a mosquito bite or something like that. Um, and then, but then as you go up the food chain, so it's like, well, what about, um, you know, killing a cow? Um, now, of course, we kill the cow, not because it's annoying me, but because we eat its we eat it for food. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not aware of him specifically saying we should be vegetarians. I, I took his point <laughs> to be that we can use utilitarianism as a way to think about animal cruelty. I certainly felt a little bit guilty about eating meat after reading the passage. <laughs> but the thing about the aliens, though, is what this shows us is that um, we'd still have inviolable rights, even if there were other creatures that were more superior to us. Mm -hmm. And that ties into the self-directedness um, mm -hmm. and, and the idea of our lives serving our own goals. Um, and, but then it's, so the, your question I take it is, if it would be therefore wrong for the aliens to use us for food, what makes it wrong for us to use a cow for food? Yeah, um, and right. I suppose it has to do with uh, assessing the mental capacities of a cow mm -hmm. um, and thinking of them as, as a different sort of thing. But whatever conclusion we come to about the cow, we're still definitely people. And so we're that's, off the menu no matter right. what. And so that's, <laughs> not only are we, but here's the thing it's not just that we're off the menu for the aliens, but we're off the menu for each other. We can't treat each other mm -hmm. as farm animals. Right. That's the that's the point he's making there, right? Whatever we want to say about the use of other animals for our purposes, his point is we can't use each other as if we mm -hmm. were farm animals. So that leads me to another question about you know what about and now I'm not I'm not talking about using people as farm animals, but in terms of people who might have cognitive limitations, might not be capable of self direction, what um, does Nozick touch on, you know, how to grapple with that? You mean somebody who's like developmentally disabled or something? Maybe developmentally disabled or even like, you know, children to a sure. degree aren't very good at making their own choices yet. Um, sure. I, I think the idea there is that as people, you know, we have responsibility. I mean, we certainly have responsibilities for our children. Mm -hmm. um, and that's arguably a consensual responsibility, right? You right. choose to have the child. You're voluntarily undertaking the responsibility of bringing up the child and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I suppose even with um, developmentally disabled people, they say, well, so they don't have the mental capacities that you're claiming are the basis of our self-directedness and our rights. Yeah, but it's there still are are our people, right? right. So I, I would imagine he would argue that uh, we have a responsibility to take them as seriously as we take each other, even mm -hmm. if they aren't themselves capable of making the kind of autonomous decisions that we, as a paradigm, think of ourselves as doing. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, and I'm glad to hear that, right? Because I, I, I get a little bit weird when there's those exceptions for you know, people who might not be so good at making their own choices. It seems like you're opening the door for lots of uh, interventions if you... Right. And of course, the, the utilitarians are actually often in favor of uh, right. those sorts of uh, changes, which Nozick, again, argues against that. Yeah. Um, so I do want to raise the issue um, with regard to, you know, gender inequality or gender wage gap. So one of the things that Nozick touches on in his work is that a lot of the unequal distribution that we observe is a function of people's choices. And I often will give talks about women's rights and economic freedom. And when I talk about, you know, what causes the gender wage gap, and I, I talk to them about the economic evidence, 
that it is choices that men and women make very differently that leads to this pattern that we observe. You know, a lot of people take issue with saying that those are real choices, right? That there are not, uh, there are social norms, there are informal rules that act as very um, serious constraints on the choices we're able to make. Um, so, so how do we deal with that type of, of uh, issue? I think we're already seeing how you deal with that. It's it's to change the norms and expectations. So when you know if you go back to look at like uh, you know kids' books from the fifties or even the sixties, um, you see a lot of highly gendered. Like here are the different careers you might go into, and all the boys are showing this one, and all the girls are showing that one. Um, and of course, the, the the trick is to say, well, you know, to encourage people to not take those distinctions seriously. It's like, can a woman be an engineer? Can a woman be a physician? Of course they can, right? And so one way to do that, of course, is with role models. So if, if there's actually women astronauts, that's how young girls figure out that it's possible for them to be an astronaut. If there's a woman who's an econ professor, that's how girls figure out that they can be econ professors. Um, if their physician is a woman, that's how they get the idea that, um, they're, that they could be a physician themselves. Um, and vice versa, of course, um, the idea that a, a man could be a nurse or something like that, mm -hmm. um, that would have been slightly weird in the 50s, but today it's not particularly weird at all. Although I think people will still assume if I say that nurse over there, I think most people will assume that I'm referring to a woman. Um, so there is still some of that sort of expectation built into people that are based on these um, uh norms or, or stereotypes or whatever. So, I mean, obviously the thing to do is to, you know, actively try to undermine those when you're raising kids to not think that professions are necessarily gender segregated that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, I, again, I don't, I'm speculating on Nozick's yeah. behalf here, but I imagine for Nozick, the liberatory nature of eroding those sorts of gender discriminations would be an important part of the liberal mindset. Having said that, though, if a bunch of people want to have a community where gender roles are more tightly regulated, they'd be free to have a community like that, provided, again, that anybody who finds this annoying can move out, uh, that they're not bound there, right? But certainly some people may still prefer uh, a of society with, uh, you know, tightly restricted gender roles. So it's part of the framework that you can make those communities provided that you're freely choosing it. You're not sort of forced into choosing it and that you can exit it if you don't like it. Yeah. One thing I often emphasize is that, you know, even um, if, you know, even though it is largely these social norms, those aren't things that you can legislate away. So there's, there's really not much role for the state to to fix that issue uh, no that's a that's a great point right because you could if, if you had a law that said women can't be dentists then yes you should repeal that law right. but if there's still 99 percent of all the dentists are men then young girls aren't necessarily going to think about dentistry as a possible profession that they could enter so like you say you, you can't really legislate there shall be more women dentists the only thing you can do is make it more attractive, make it more available, make it seem more like a real possibility for them. And that, that sort of thing takes time because, you know, again, when I was, when I was a little kid, um, all the doctors and dentists were male, but when my kids go to the doctor, or the dentist, there's lots of female practitioners. And so it wouldn't have ever occurred to them that that was gender segregated. Um, what do you think is Nozick's most misunderstood argument or idea? Do you think there's anything that people kind of consistently get wrong that you'd love to set the record straight on? One thing that they consistently get wrong, I mentioned in our previous conversation that he doesn't have an argument for rights and just assumes that people have rights. So the whole thing is a house of cards. Uh, that's, that's quite wrong. Um, and that's a mistake that I really wish people would stop making. Uh, I guess the other thing that I often see as a misrepresentation of his view is this, you could sell yourself into slavery argument. Um, the, the framework 
doesn't allow for a slave society. That's logically inconsistent with the nature of the framework. Um, the idea that um, you maintain uh, right of choice and right of exit, no matter which part of which community you're associating with um, means that you couldn't possibly be selling yourself into slavery. You could agree to a, a harsh working contract, right? So I could say something like, well, sure, I'll work uh, seven days a week for you for the next six months. Um, well, why would I do that? I might do that if you were offering me something in return that I valued more highly than however uncomfortable it would be to work for you for seven days a week seven hours, 70 hours a week, whatever. Um, but if I didn't think that was worth it, why would I be doing it in the first place? So if I did think it was a good idea, then clearly I ought to be free to make that contract. But that's not slavery. That's me agreeing mm -hmm. to work hard for you for something that I'm getting in return, which I value more highly than the negatives of my doing that unpleasant thing for you. So that means that it's literally not the same thing as being a slave. It's just somebody who has really harsh working conditions that and he's chosen voluntarily. Exactly. And I could quit um, yeah. because the framework protects right of exit. So it has to respect my right to choose an unpleasant, difficult job and my right to quit if it's too unpleasant or if you change the terms last minute, right? So mm -hmm. I said I was going to work for you seven days a week for 10 hours a day. And then you said, well, look, it's actually going to be 12 hours a day or I'm going to hit you. Okay, then I quit. Mm -hmm. And if I have the right to quit, right, the right of exit that the framework should be guaranteeing, then again, that's not slavery. So I, I think people get that wrong about him also. I guess the third thing that people get wrong, um, and this touches on something you mentioned briefly, is that, um, and this is not just Nozick, but anybody who advocates uh, a completely voluntary and market-based order, they must just not care if the poor starve to death. And so, you know, Nozick here, he's hes this heartless guy. He doesn't care about what happens to, to poor people because they'll just all be poor and who cares? Again, that's not something that you'll find in the book at all. And indeed, quite the opposite, um, because frequently the barriers to the advancement of those people is created by the very patterns that he's arguing against. And the very idea that um, society can collectively form regulations, restrictions on economic activity that makes it harder for people to get ahead and realize greater gains from their talents and skills. Are there any tensions in Nozick's work? I mean, he's, he's one of the most, you know, his arguments are, are very, very logically flawless when I read them. But have you noticed any any areas where maybe he's proposed an idea that might be at odds with uh, individual rights? Any tensions? Well, yeah. Uh, the, um, the first part of the book where he argues against the anarchists, um, uh, there's some reason to think that um, the anarchists have not been refuted by part one of the book. Um, he's um, he's arguing that um, all the, 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 the these private protective agencies would all merge, and then we'd eventually end up with one dominant protective agency, which would then, he says, have the authority to exclude others from entering the field. Like once the one became big enough to count as the dominant one, if another firm wanted to enter that market, they'd be excluded, that the dominant protective agency could exclude them from the market. And he says they'd have to compensate them, but still they would be entitled to refuse them entry into the market. That actually might be contrary to the spirit of individual rights, mm -hmm. right? Because once you've got the dominant protective agency, why couldn't I start my own competitive startup firm? Why couldn't mm -hmm. I try to challenge? And of course, economic history is filled with examples like that. Challenges to AT&T, challenges to Microsoft, right? The, the, the challenges to the, the, you know VHS, right? This happens all the time. Um, that somebody seems to have this completely dominant market share, and then someone comes along and disrupts it, either by offering the same thing better or by offering a completely different thing. 
Right back in the mm-hmm. '70s, there was some dispute about whether Betamax or VHS was the better mode for VCRs, <laughs> right? And of course, one of those won short term, but of course, in the long term, they both lost because nobody uses video cassettes anymore anyway, right? right? So when Nozick says once the dominant protective agency is dominant, it can prevent others from entering the market as comp- as competition. That actually might not quite work. Mm-hmm. What would you say to someone that says, well, you know, this, this utopia sounds nice, um, but, you know, we've never seen anything like that. Are there historical examples or even modern examples where we, I know you mentioned the Amish, and, and I personally agree, the Amish are a pretty good example of this. Even if we look at their within the Amish community, they kind of break apart and form new communities when they disagree with each other. Mm-hmm. So that's maybe one modern example of this. But what about some other examples of, of where something like this has existed? You could argue that the United States is kind of like that because life in New York City is very different from life in uh, rural Kansas or something like that. And and mm-hmm. so if we think about like what life is like for rural Kansas farm communities versus, uh, you know, um, Carrie Bradshaw in Manhattan, right? So the, uh, those are obviously very, very different lifestyles. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, 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 the idea that once the world gets interconnected, then we can see some examples of that because like, it, it, like in the, in the uh, Middle Ages, you wouldn't even know what was going on 5,000 mm-hmm. miles away, right? right? But now it's like, you, you know what's happening in China, you know what's happening in Korea, you know what's happening in Australia, right? So are there some aspects of Australian life that are recognizably similar to American life? Sure. Are there other things that are quite different? Sure, right? And then even within Australia, I'll bet you get similar things, right? Is it living in Sydney the same thing as living in, in you know, the outback? Probably not, right? So the more we can see other parts of the world through our communications and, and, and exchanges, the more we can see, well, there's lots of different ways to live. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is why some people move, right? Some people who are born in rural communities say, you know what, I want to move to the city. Other people brought up in urban environments say, you know what, I, this is for the birds. I want to have a more uh, rural, uh, bucolic life, right? <laughs> some people live, grow up in a warm area, they want to move to where it's colder. Some people mm-hmm. grow up in a cold place, they want to move where it's warmer. Some people like the ocean, some people don't like the ocean, right? Some people like the mountains, some people don't like the mountains. Um, Also, some people like more um, conservative religious societies. Other people prefer a more secular open society. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, if you you can choose to move to these other places, that's awesome. To the extent you're forbidden to move either Mm -hmm. into or out of those places, right? That's That's contrary to the spirit of human freedom. Um, But so, you know, it's like, if the question is, is there any example in history of a fully libertarian society? Well, yeah, of course not. But that's not an argument against the theory because Mm -hmm. there's, uh, there wasn't any precedent for, um, you know, colonies of Great Britain breaking away from Great Britain either. Um, So you can do stuff that's never been done before. And in any case, philosophically, that's not an argument. Mm -hmm. Um, The argument is, here's a good idea. So either it's a good idea or it's not a good idea. And whether it's ever been done before isn't relevant to whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. So either Nozick's making coherent arguments or he isn't. Right. so I, I don't. I, I, so part of me is like I don't even want to talk about the historical. Is there any precedent for this? But right. again, as I say, there is ways of looking at the world, which do sort of point in the direction of why it's advantageous to recognize human pluralism and mm-hmm. recognize that one size fits all isn't going to work for everybody. Right. So I'm glad you mentioned the interconnectedness and and. You know, we live in the world as it exists today, which uh, most states are well beyond uh, the scope of what Nozick prescribed in his minimal state. Um, Are there any kind of practical policy goals or any steps that we might be able to take to scale back to something closer to what Nozick uh, thought the state should look like? 
Well, the problem with that is it, it typically requires people who have power to give up their power, which typically they're reluctant to do. Um, but things that would there are realistic things that we can look for. For example, there's been a lot of attention paid in the last five or six years to the ways in which occupational licensure restrictions disproportionately have an adverse effect on women and minority communities. Um, so then if the complaint is, how come these people can't get jobs, and then it looks like the government is literally preventing them from getting jobs, one answer to the problem would be, well, get rid of those restrictions, then they'll be able to uh, capitalize on their own skills and, and you know, make gainful employment. And we actually have started to see some progress over the last five, six years of cutting back on the scope of occupational licensure regulations mm -hmm. that prohibit uh, people from fully capitalizing on their own skills. So that's that's a sort of positive trend I might look at. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and then also just in terms of things like um, uh, greater acceptance of interracial and later same-sex marriage, right? A again, it's within recent memory that if you loved somebody who looked different from you, you literally weren't allowed to be with that person. And that's largely gone now. And, and we're, mm -hmm. we're certainly making great strides uh, in that direction. So there, there's things that can and do change. Um, mm -hmm. But a lot of the things that the government does, it's surely going to cling to tooth and nail um, yeah. because people that have power don't like giving up power. Well, we are almost out of time, and I just wanted to to end with um, you. You, your last section of the Essential Nozick book ends with a really great list of readings and other resources. Are there any maybe blogs or other podcasts or any other resources that you can think of that, if the anyone in the audience is really interested in learning a lot more, that you would point them in that direction? Oh, there's a podcast um, that's put out by um, Canada's um, Institute for Liberal Studies. Uh, mm -hmm. They have a great podcast, which I recommend. Um, and I think the Cato Institute has a good podcast as well. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, those are certainly worth people listening to, for sure. Right. Well, is there anything else that we didn't discuss that you'd like one one last word? I just like to, I also, I guess I should remind people that Nozick was a complete philosopher and you know, he, he only wrote this one book on political philosophy, but he wrote five other books and he often took some criticism for not having gone back over the political philosophy stuff, despite his many critics. Um, but that's because he thought, look, I said what I wanted to say about political philosophy. Now I want to say something about these other areas of philosophy. And a lot of his other work is also really fascinating if you're interested in you know, theories of knowledge or theories of consciousness or whatever. So he was really, he, he wasn't a sort of a one note singer. He was a really a complete philosopher, all of whose work is challenging and interesting. My favorite as a political philosopher is his political philosophy, but his other work is also quite worth reading and very interesting. Well, I'll have to definitely do some additional reading myself because I am only really familiar with Anarchy, State, and Utopia, which is an excellent book for anybody who hasn't read it. I agree. Thank you so much for talking with us. I really appreciated learning from you today. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. You've been listening to Essential Scholars, a new podcast series that explores the ideas and insights of some of history's most influential thinkers. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to subscribe and head over to EssentialScholars.org to learn more. See you next time.